certainly type that in. I've got this little screen over here that says chat, and I'll try to answer those questions so that everyone can hear the answers as well. Uh, but before I get started, I always like to tell people a little bit about myself. I think if you know your speaker a little more on a personal basis, well, then it, it helps as you go through the presentation. Uh, I was born and raised in Colorado City, which is just north of San Angelo, Texas, about 75 miles. And I was fortunate to grow up in a ranching environment. Uh, my family didn't own a ranch, but my grandfather worked on a ranch. He worked on the same ranch for 56 years. And then my dad uh, has managed the same ranch for the last 38 years. Well, prior to him taking that position, and during the time when I was growing up, he worked on several different ranches, and, and we did a lot of day work, and we traveled around the state. And that was a unique opportunity for me. It gave me the opportunity to visit different operations, see different operations, those that were successful in what they were doing and those that, that were not successful. And that, that really spurred an interest in me in, in brush management and range management and, and the ranching industry as a whole. So when I graduated high school, I went to Angel State University. My goal was to be a ranch manager. The ranch my grandfather worked on, the general manager was a, a gentleman named Deb Waldrop, and I wanted to be uh, something like Dub Walter running large ranches like the Spade Ranches where my grandfather worked. When I graduated in 1990, the job market was truly, truly awful. It was just terrible. And I reluctantly went and decided to go to grad school. I didn't want to do it, but it's probably the best decision I ever made. When I was working on my master's. I realized quickly I had a lot of interest in research. I enjoyed that process, and particularly when it dealt with range management issues. And so completed my master's, and I was fortunate enough to be accepted in the Ph.D. program at Utah State University. And from a professional standpoint, that was probably the most rewarding time of my life. Completed that project. Uh, there was a teaching research position that opened up here at Angelo State University. I applied for it, got that position, and I've been here for the last 23 years. The unique thing about my position, it is teaching and it is research, but it's also um, required to manage the rangelands on a 6,000 acre working ranch research facility. And uh, that's what I'm going to talk about today. We're going to talk a little bit of science, and then I'm going to build on that, talk about some misconceptions out there, and I'm going to build on some of the things that I've done, and particularly some of the mistakes that I've made managing that rangeland. Those are lessons that were hard learned but well learned, and hopefully by focusing on some of those decisions, you can avoid some of the same mistakes I made. So, particularly in our semi-arid arid regions of Texas, areas west of I-35 is an arbitrary boundary. Uh, you start talking about drought management, and it quickly evolves or morphs into a discussion of grazing management, as it should be. Grazing management has always looked for the silver bullet. We've always looked for the perfect grazing system or scheme that's going to solve all our problems. Uh, that's going to grow more forage, make life easy, make us all wealthy and wise. And Unfortunately, it doesn't exist. If that system exists, we haven't discovered it. I don't know that we ever will. Grazing management also has some misconceptions. I've labeled it here as paradigms, and I'll explain why here in just a second. But it has some misconceptions that, that affect a lot of people's decisions, at least in my opinion, they're misconceptions. Things like grazing benefits grasses. If we look at the scientific data, though, we know that grazing removes green leaves, the tissue that plants need to carry out photosynthesis and, and to, to accumulate carbohydrates. It potentially move, removes growth tissue. It may benefit the plant next to the plant graze, but it's not going to benefit that plant that was particularly grazed. Likewise, there's a misconception that grazing somehow helps prepare a seed bed. And maybe it does, but when you look at our perennial grasses that we see on rangelands, those that we manage for, most of those don't rely heavy, heavily on seed production, especially in the semi-arid, arid regions of Texas. And then finally, there's a misconception out there that grazing somehow improves infiltration rates. And this is a big one. We're talking drought management. Uh, infiltration rates become critical. We've got to capture the precipitation that falls, capture it in our soils. It's got to infiltrate into those soils, and then we've got to convert it into plant material. 
when we overgraze or we concentrate livestock in smaller areas, uh, we tend to reduce infiltration rates. And we'll talk about that why that's the, the case. Now, rain science is not perfect, um, but when we rely on scientific facts, information generated from science, we make better decisions. No scientific dis discipline is complete. No scientific discipline is, is perfect. Each and every one of us are familiar with the laws of gravity. And those laws hold true, but they have their shortcomings. Einstein came up with the general theory of relativity to deal with some of those shortcomings. And even he knew that E equals MC squared has its shortcomings. And he spent the rest of his career trying to come up with a special theory of relativity. He was never successful in doing that. Fortunately for physics and the rest of us in the world, individuals like Richard Feynman and Stephen Hawking and many others came up with quantum mechanics or quantum physics. And that's about all I know about it is, is that's what it's called. It's the on level of comprehension. Uh, but it built on the general theory of relativity. Interestingly, it's not complete either. It, it has its shortcomings. I've gotten to where I like to watch the Discovery Channels on TV or the Learning Channel. One of my favorite shows is a show called How the Universe Works. And the really interesting thing that comes out of that show is science says the universe should behave this way. And in many cases, it does. But there's sometimes it can't explain what's happening. So science is never perfect. Uh, but when we rely on science, scientific facts, we stand a better chance of making better decisions. So rain science has taught us some things. It's taught us that rangelands are renewable. Our grasses evolved with grazing. They evolved the mechanisms to withstand grazing. Those grasses are ultimately trying to survive. Uh, they're trying to grow. They're trying to carry out photosynthesis. And they're trying to reproduce. Uh, the perennial grasses, the bunch grasses that provide good feed for our livestock, most of those rely on vegetative reproduction and not sexual or seed production. We'll talk about that in a little more detail. And of course, in semi-arid, arid regions of the world, particularly here in Texas, we have to capture that rainfall. It's never frequent enough, and oftentimes it's not intense enough, so we have to do what we can to capture that in the soil and convert that into vegetation growth. So it's not complete. We have some facts, but unfortunately, uh, we end up relying on common sense and rule of thumb and hunches and untested theories to make decisions in many cases. And that's okay. We use the best knowledge we have available to us. We make the best decisions we can make. We don't ignore the scientific data there, but understand it's not always complete. So principles and paradigms of grazing management. What do we know? Let's talk a little bit more about some of those misconceptions that are out there. Uh, when I talk about grazing management to an undergrad course or to a graduate course, I talk, start, talking off, start off talking about paradigms. And paradigms are a topic that's usually not discussed in a range course, maybe discussed in a business course, but I think they're important. I'm going to try to challenge some of your paradigms today. Uh, feel free to challenge mine. I have my own paradigms. Uh, that's what this process is for. Uh, but paradigms are our thoughts, our beliefs, our philosophy, how we think, think things work. And that's not all bad. Everybody has them. But when they become overwhelming and we begin to think that our idea is the only way to do it, then we suffer from what I call paradigm paralysis. And then they start to filter out information. They don't let facts filter through that don't agree with what we believe. And I'll give you some examples of that. The best example I, I, I can think of comes from, a, uh, from watchmaking. In the late 1960s, at a trade show, the quartz movement watch was introduced. And the Swiss dominated the watch and clock business up to that point. And they looked at that technology and they thought it was neat, thought it was cool, but that didn't match their paradigm. Their paradigm was the clocks worked by gears, by springs, and they had to be wound. And so they didn't accept it. Well, Seiko and Texas Instruments saw that technology. They were not in the watchmaking business at that time. They accepted that information. They took it and they ran with it. And they dominated the watch and clock business for decades. Many of those Swiss watchmakers went out of business because their paradigm didn't match up. It filtered that data out. Those that did finally accepted that. 
there's a gentleman that some of you may have heard of uh, that avoids that paradigm paralysis problem. It's a gentleman named Charles Koch. Uh, if you kept up with the last presidential election, uh, you probably heard of the Koch brothers. They were mentioned in the media on many cases. And Charles Koch is one of the Koch brothers. He's CEO of Koch Industries, one of the largest industries in the world. Uh, he's an interesting guy. He makes business decisions based on what the market dictates to him. It's all market-based management. And he also seeks out opportunities, but if those opportunities don't work, or if the method in which Coke Industries has been doing something, that's their paradigm, once it stops working or the market changes, then he steps away from it. You may or may not know that Coke Industries owns Matador Ranches, and there's Matador Ranch in Matador, Texas, and there's a division in Kansas and one in Montana. And they operate that ranch the same way. I'll give you an example. Several years ago, they saw a, a profit potential in pen raised deer. And so they explored it, they invested in it, and they, they went full force forward with a pen raised deer project that they ran for about five years. And after five years, they decided it was not profitable for them, and they walked away from it. They got away from that paradigm and went in a different direction. Uh, they also got uh, involved in the Agaousi cattle breed several years ago. And I don't know what you know or don't know about Agaousis, but Japanese breed that has a different carcass. It's, it, they, they deposit fat differently in muscle fibers. End result is it's apparently more healthy for you to consume. And then those carcasses, a higher percentage go choice and prime, which brings a prime price at the market. They got involved with that project, heavily involved with Agusi cattle. And one time, a few years ago, all the cows, for the most part, at Matador, Texas, that they had, they owned, were F1 crosses. They were Hereford Agusi crosses. And then the premiums for that carcass went away. And when those premiums went away, at the same time, they were seeing a 30% reduction in weaning weights. And it became not profitable for them to continue that process. And so they walked away from it. So as we go through this stuff, uh, be a skeptic. Be a skeptic of what I tell you. Be a skeptic of what anybody tells you or teaches you or you read or see or hear. And be a skeptic of your own ideas. This guy's not. Uh, he's caught in paradigm paralysis. He says, I've been in the cattle business for 50 years. I've lost money all but 47 when I worked in town. I saw that cartoon. It reminded me of a uh, field tour I went on about three years ago. It was a, a program that morning, and then that afternoon we toured a ranch. They were practicing some very intensive grazing management, animal impact type stuff. And the first stop we went to on that ranch, it just looked incredible. I mean, it was just incredible amount of forage production, and it really made me question my own paradigms about grazing management. I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm missing something here. Uh, I need to look at this again. Well, as we went through the rest of the day, I learned that that first stop had been set aside for a year, and they hadn't grazed it for a year. And as we looked at the rest of the ranch, he was suffering from drought conditions, forage was short, and it was a completely different perspective, what I saw. Well, as we completed the tour, we ended up back at the headquarters, and he made a statement that stuck in my mind. He said, after doing this for 40 years, I still haven't figured it out. I still haven't figured it out. If you've been doing anything for 40 years and you haven't figured it out, you're caught in paradigm paralysis. You need to change your paradigm. So what he was attempting to do, he was convinced that was the only way and the best way to do it, but it wasn't working out for him. He couldn't see it. He literally could not see the forest for the trees. This next statement you see on your slides says, after 13 years, I can say it's still the hardest, simple thing I've ever tried to do. The lack of success we've seen in some areas not being because holistic management doesn't work, it's because we haven't practiced it properly. Uh, he may or may be right or may not be right, but the point I want to bring out is his paradigm, uh, this gentleman that said this quote, is, is the way and the only way to do that. And he's suffering from paradigm paralysis. I think he needs to consider up other options. So, what has science taught us? What do we know to be true? What facts can we rely on? Well, we know plants respond differently to grazing. Uh, 
some plants like these down here with it labeled as A don't tolerate grazing very well. If we increase stocking rate uh, down along the bottom axis from left to right, those plants tend to disappear. They decrease under grazing pressure. Others, like these labeled B, right here, oops, I turn my arrow off. Here. They can withstand grazing up to a point, but then if we overgraze it, they're going to disappear as well. On this graph, you see C up here as well, and that was a uh, theory that a guy named Sam McNaughton proposed. Sam was working in Serengeti Plains, and he, he suggested there are some plants that actually benefit from being grazed, and they will actually produce more forage after being grazed than they would beforehand. It's a great sounding idea. Unfortunately, science doesn't support that. There's hundreds of papers been published, and, and as far as we can tell, those, those type of plants don't exist. Plants don't benefit from being grazed. They may try to survive. They have mechanisms to do that, but they're not going to produce more forage because they were eaten. Science has also taught us that we can't maximize plant production or optimize plant production and animal production at the same time. Uh, to optimize or maximize plant production, uh, we cannot graze it. That allows the maximum amount of leaf material, and we can convert sunlight into plant material, but then we don't have any way to harvest that forage. If we try to maximize secondary production or livestock production, at least on a short-term basis, to selling more calves at weaning, then we're compromising our plant's ability to capture sunlight. So it's a challenge that we face. It's, it's the fact that we cannot optimize or particularly maximize both of those at the same time. Grazing affects plants, there's no question about it. The process of a cow taking a bite of a plant removes photosynthetic material. It removes green leaves, the very stuff of existence for that plant in terms of carrying out photosynthesis and building carbohydrates. It can potentially remove growth tissue. Now, that depends on stage of development, how much we're defoliating those plants. And I want to point one thing out to you is this little apparatus or appendage right here. You can't see that with your naked eye, but that's called the terminal meristem. On this slide, you can see it. And that's the tissue that that's causes growth of new leaves. It's what initiates growth in the spring as those grass plants bud out. It's what will eventually develop into the seed head. If that part of that grass plant, that tiller, loses that tissue, it cannot grow anymore. It cannot replace what's being lost. So as that grass plant matures and goes from this stage to this stage, and then we start seeing stems emerge, sticking up off the ground, then the plant's susceptible to grazing. At least that tiller that has that terminal meristem being pushed upwards, and that's what develops into the seed head, uh, is exposed to grazing. And if a cow removes that, or sheep, or goat, or deer, or whatever it species may be, removes that growth tissue, that part of the plant can't grow anymore. We start seeing defoliation levels over 50% in that plant, then we, <clears throat> then we start compromising its ability to survive. Now the impact of grazing changes seasonally. Uh, sometimes plants are in early stages of growth, like this guy over here, and that growth tissue is down at the base of the plant, and it's protected, and that grass plant can regrow. But as it matures, that terminal meristem, or we call it the apical meristem, will be pushed upwards, and at that point it becomes susceptible to grazing. So, I uh, stole this, this illustration from, from uh, Dave Brisky, he had it in the publication, previous illustration came from as well, but what this shows is a grass plant. Half of it's been eaten off, half of it hasn't. And our magnifying glass is drawn on here is trying to point out this apical meristem or terminal meristem is being elevated. That's when the plant's susceptible to grazing. As it moves into the growing season, if we're not prudent in our decisions, uh, that part of the plant could be removed and it could certainly hinder its longevity and ability to survive. 
The other thing I like about this illustration is it shows that three of those pillars have been eaten off and three haven't. That's another important point. We're making our grazing management decisions. If we can stop defoliation of those preferred species at 50%, like this illustration, then we've got enough pillars remaining, those three pillars sticking up, that it can survive and replenish what it's lost. Uh, other facts. So I mentioned reproduction at the beginning of the presentation. Our bunch grasses, our perennial grasses, the big blue stems, little blue stems, side oats, other species that we manage for, don't rely heavily on seed production. Now that doesn't mean that we can't see some seedlings popping up from place to place from time to time, but generally speaking in semi-arid arid regions of the state, those plants are not going to rely heavily on seed production for reproduction. They'll produce seeds, but we see very few seedlings in the years, but they rely on vegetative means. They'll send out stolons or runners on top of the soil surface that'll root down at the node to create new plants. They'll send out rhizomes, which are the same things below the soil surface, to pick up new plants. Or like this bunch of grass we have in this illustration, that plant will get bigger and bigger each year. It gets a little bit bigger around each year. You may see the center of that plant eventually die out. Uh, that's a natural process, it's a competition for sunlight. But as that plant gets bigger, it covers more space, and it's a means of reproduction. It's a slow process, uh, but that's one of the ways those plants certainly reproduce. We know that the majority of the plant species, or grass plants, biomass is below ground. Uh, Majority of it's tied up in the root system. Grass roots don't live long times. Uh, they don't live a long period. They're just, and they're quickly replaced. But root growth is secondary to above ground growth. Uh, so if above ground growth has been removed through grazing, it's going to have to replace that material before it can replace those roots. The end result is at 50% defoliation, it's able to replace above ground, it's able to replace below ground, it's able to, to compete for nutrients in the soil, it's able to compete for, for uh, water as well. Once we start seeing 70% of that plant defoliated on a consistent basis, fruit mass starts to decline by 50%. Now we've compromised its ability to compete. Then of course we get up in an overgrazed situation and we're removing 90% of that vegetation root mass declines to the point that it's unable to compete for water, it's unable to compete for nutrients, and more than likely it will lose uh, all its competitive ability. Plants next to it that were not grazed will dominate that sand. You'll end up with those species that are less productive, less nutritious to feed free cattle, and ultimately do a uh, poor job of holding the soil in place. So drought management's the topic. And the one thing that you and I can do as landowners to control our ability to withstand droughts is controlling what's growing above ground. Uh, Tom Thoreau, who was at Texas A&M University for a long period of time, uh, first published this illustration, and I like it a lot. And Tom pointed out to us that, that what we do above ground ultimately is going to determine what happens below ground. He illustrated that in an oak mot or a bunch grass stand, the majority of the precipitation that falls is going to infiltrate in the soil. 81% in that oak mot, 75% in that bunch grass stand. So now we're, we're avoiding some of the pitfalls that we see on Texas rangelands when droughts occur. We're able to capture that moisture when it occurs. We're able to have it infiltrate into the soil and then we're able to convert it into plant material. As we move from bunch grass stands here to short grass stands, we dramatically reduce our infiltration rates. And then, of course, we get to bare ground situations. Less than 25% of the rainfall we receive is going to infiltrate. 75% of that's going to run off, and that's a worst case scenario. Now, one of the things that, that affects affects how much we capture slightly that we don't think a lot about is, is interception loss. In trees, woody plants, the way their leaves are designed, uh, capture a lot of rainfall, particularly on small rainfall events. 
These oat moths may build up a lot of litter, and that can intercept rainfall as well. And the inter end result is, particularly on small rainfall events, that water will actually evaporate out before it hits the soil. So while we have a high infiltration rate under some of the most stands of trees, in some cases you could argue we're better off with that bunch grass stand here because we've reduced our interception loss. It's going to intercept less water and allow more water to reach the soil surface. So here we are. Here's our two situations we often see. On the right over here, we've got a situation where we've maintained adequate grass cover. You do not see bare ground. That's the type of situation. The second example, we had 75% infiltration rates. The majority of the water that falls on that situation is going to infiltrate in the soil and can be converted into vegetation. It's going to protect us from some of the fluctuations we see in rainfall. On the left, this is what we want to try to avoid. Very low grass cover, we've got lots of bare ground. The rainfall that falls on that situation is going to either run off if it's got some slope to it, or it's going to sit on the soil surface and it'll evaporate away. And we essentially lose the majority of that water. As rainfall falls on this soil, uh, it actually dislodges some soil particles. And they're either picked up and eroded away, or they will sit there and actually form a crust on top of that soil which further reduces infiltration rates, which can cause some significant problems for us as well. So to avoid droughts, our first point I want you to remember is if we maintain adequate ground cover, we can capture that rainfall and convert it into plant material for our livestock and our wildlife. You know, as this, this these facts or this knowledge base was developing, uh, it got us to thinking about this whole idea of interception loss and what would happen if we started removing more of those trees and if we're capturing more water in the soil, can we will we see an increase in river and stream and spring flow? And we all most of us thought that would be the case. Unfortunately it's not. Uh, Brad Wilcox is a watershed specialist there at AM has done some really nice work. And what he's shown is if we get significant rainfall, enough rainfall to cause those rivers to start flowing or increase flow, it doesn't make a lot of difference what's above ground. Now, grass cover will allow us to capture it and convert it into plant material, but it's not going to go into deep drainage. In fact, it's one publication, uh, the one I pulled this figure out, he looked at the Guadalupe Frio Nueces Lano River and saw that. As brushes increased along those watersheds, they actually flow more now than they did in the past. So that's what some of the things that, that related to this topic science has taught us. Let's talk about some constraints we face. Again, I'm going to focus on the western half of the state, semi-arid, arid regions west of I-35, areas where we see high evapor evapotranspiration losses. We see highly variable precipitation patterns, both within a year and across years. We know that for vegetation to recover, given our precipitation, often takes 90 days or more to recover from being grazed. Regardless of where you are in the United States or the world, uh, livestock are selective grazing, grazers, not going to pick and choose everything equally. And then, of course, when we start concentrating those animals, we start overgrazing those animals, we start compacting soils and losing the ability to capture moisture. So, a little bit of data for you. This is precipitation data for, for San Angelo, Texas. Uh, the bars you see along the bottom are average monthly precip from January through December. And then the line you see above that is potential evapotranspiration. In other words, how much water we're going to lose through evaporation and transpiration. San Angelo, Texas is a semi-arid region because on average we're going to lose more water than we're going to capture. That is a huge constraint in preparing for the next drought and storing water. But it's also an opportunity. It's an opportunity in when we look at periods like May and June, which are two of our wetter months of the year, and September and October. It's an opportunity that we need to position ourselves for when that rainfall does occur, we're able to capture that rainfall and convert it into plant growth. So, San Angelo, Texas is also a highly variable from one year to the next in terms of rainfall. 
So the shaded in there you can see at the bottom is is the monthly or excuse me the yearly precipitation from 2000 or excuse me 1904 to 2017. Our average here is 21 inches. Uh, you get a few very wet years. You see some peaks there, uh, but unfortunately most years are below average. There's way more valleys than peaks. You may notice some very dry years in there. In the teens, we had a significant drought. Uh, 30s, Dust Bowl era, 32, 33 was extremely dry. The drought that everyone seems to know, even if they didn't live through it, is the drought of the 50s. That's the most extensive driest period we've had for San Angelo, Texas. The driest year was 1956. We had a little over nine inches of rainfall. I'm going to target a couple other time frames. I'm going to target this time frame right here. Starting in 1998 through about 2003, and then of course I want to target 2011. That's a time frame that we've all, most of us remember being dry statewide. So our rainfall pattern is highly variable. Uh, that limits how much we can capture moisture, when we can capture moisture, and creates a uh, large challenge. It's also variable within a year. Okay, you can pick almost any year. Out of random, I randomly picked 2006, and look at monthly precipitation, and compare that to your monthly averages. So the blue lines hold our average long-term monthly average. Two wettest months a year: May and June, followed by September and October, and then the green line was what we received in 2006. And so we went from boom-bust situation. We were below average for most of the year. July well, was very dry. Finally, got some rain in August. So again, positioning yourself throughout the year becomes a huge problem because it's had such a high variability, not only across years, but within years. Livestock selectively grazed. This old gal sees something she likes and she's going to get it. Uh, all livestock do that. Uh, if we were all in the same location right now and decided to go to lunch together, went to a restaurant wherever we were, and they had a buffet, no two of us would choose the same kind and mix of, of, of foods off that buffet. Talking to Pete earlier, we know Pete would not choose a chicken. Megan probably would choose a chicken. The rest of us, who knows? So we wouldn't choose the same kind and mix of vegetation. Cows, sheep, goats, deer, all the same. They all have their own preferences. They're going to select that forage. They're going to consume it first. When they go back for seconds or thirds, like we would do at a buffet, many of us would go back for seconds or thirds, we would probably select some of the same foods. If they've disappeared, we might select something else. But I'll bet you, for each and every one of us, there's a food on that buffet that we're not going to choose. Cattle, sheep, and goats are that same way. That's, that's uh, independent of what grazing system we're talking about. We can certainly concentrate those animals in some systems, force them to eat different things, uh, but they still have their preferences. They're still going to avoid some things, and they're going to select some things first and foremost. So, last constraint I think I want to mention to you is is what we do or what we can potentially do in terms of infiltration rates. Now, you may have a hard time seeing this little graph over on the side, but uh, there's some terms there I want to bring to your attention. The first one is LEX. There's my arrow when I want it. LEX stands for livestock exposure. So this is infiltration rates. And LEX be a livestock exposure. No grazing, no livestock. It had the highest infiltration rate. Just below that is moderately continuously grazed. So we've got the right stocking rate and we may we're grazing it, albeit continuous, we can still maintain a relatively high infiltration rate. Then we get down here to where we start increasing stocking rates, we start concentrating animals, or even down here where we've got a heavy stocking rate, we dramatically increase infiltration rates. As we concentrate those livestock in, in smaller areas or we overgraze that, we start to lose soil structure. Soil structure is the poor spaces in the soil. Water has to have some place to infiltrate to. If we lose that structure, we lose that ability to have water infiltrate into it, and it's going to evaporate off. So, there's some constraints, there's some misconceptions, and there's some facts we know. Let's talk about some of the lessons that I've learned. Let's show you uh, uh, some, a little bit of stuff that happened before I got here. 
Back in 1980, I didn't even start college back then. Back in 1980, Angel State University started an intensive grazing system. And this is a diagram, a drawing of some of our pastures. And so we installed a short duration grazing system on pastures starting with number pasture 21 through 36. So lots of electric fences. Alan Savory suggested we could double our stocking rate. And so we put together a herd slash flock of livestock that consisted of 80 cows and 200 head of sheep. Smallest pasture was pasture labeled up here number 34, and it actually had about 34 acres in that. So for a day or so, or maybe two, we'd have 80 cows and 34 cows in that system. So we put that system in here, 1980. And then I want to focus on a uh, period between 1983 and 1984. So we put the system in, it worked fairly well for us until 1983. 1983 was a very harsh winter, and it did not rain in 1983. We ran out of forage, we had to destock that system. Those cattle were shipped to uh, north of Pecos and pastured. It started raining in 84, we were finally able to come back and and we changed some things up. We, it wasn't me, but the folks that were here at that time, we reduced our stocking rate. We got away from that double our stocking rate. Instead of having 80 cows and 200 head of sheep in that system, we went back to 40 cows and 100 head of sheep. And that worked pretty well during this period. Uh, I had a lot of above average precipitation years, a few dry years scattered in there. And that worked well until 1998. And by then I was here. And I made some drastic mistakes. In 1998, our pastures were too short. It stopped raining on us. And it didn't really rain much consistently from 99 through that time. You can see it's below average, but the thing that's not clear from looking at averages is most of our rainfall we received in those years was actually during the wintertime. It was actually after um, we were past the stage of growing more forage. We again destocked the ranch. Um, probably the worst decisions I've made going into that system and trying to recover from that, we did destock that ranch. I decided I was never going to do that again. After pasturing those cows in plains and sheep down at Fort McCavert, uh, we still didn't have any forage. We sent some really nice Angus, jet, Angus genetics to Lone Star Packing, and we sent lots of good sheep to producers' livestock auction. I told myself I'd never put the ranch myself in that condition again and so we took out our intensive grazing system we removed lots of miles of electric fence i reduced my stocking rate further down to what i thought i could carry in a drought situation and when 2011 hit we were in a completely different position we went through one of the driest years we've had in 2011 we never de-stocked when it finally started raining in august we had enough ground cover uh, that you really didn't realize would even been in a dry situation. We recovered within 30 days. So let's look at what some of that data looked like. Um, 1998, I said, was dry. We see this year right here, or this month right here, March. looks like March was pretty good. That was one rainfall event of over five inches. I had taken our pastures too short. We didn't capture that moisture. It ran off. And then we were followed by some very dry months, particularly June and July. Or excuse me, that was in, in, in May. That was one morning fall then. I said March. It was June and July. And then it didn't rain again until August. In August when it rained, it was hot. We started getting some rainfall, and we didn't capture it. We were in a situation that looked just like this. We had lots of bare ground. We had short forage. That rainfall fell. It either ran off or with the 100 degree temperatures we were seeing that August, it evaporated off and evaporated off quickly. And we were in the situation we were forced to destock that ranch. 2011, we'd reduced stocking rate. We'd done away with the intensive grazing system. Uh, incredibly challenging year, uh, incredibly dry in terms of rainfall. Really no rainfall to speak of until we hit August. And in August, we had a very wet month. And this time, I uh, made the right decision. We had ample ground cover. We captured that moisture in the soil. It didn't evaporate. It did not run off. 
and we converted it back into plant material. And so by October 2011, uh, we were back in a situation that essentially didn't look like we'd gone through a drought situation. Good diversity of plants, we had plants that matured out. We never destocked in 2011 and recovered very, very quickly. I will tell you that um, I was concerned about 2017. Uh, winter 2016 was wet. Uh, first part of the winter in 2017 over here was wet. And then it quit raining on us. And we were below average. And it was a challenging year, no question about it. Kind of like 2011, we really didn't get a lot of rainfall until we hit over here uh, in August and September. So, but again, we, we positioned ourselves differently. This is a photograph from August 2017. Looking at those conditions, you'd never know it's dry. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of the other things we've done to better position ourselves here in just a second. But, so what have we done? Where have we been? 1980, we put in an SDG system, double stocking rate. We ended up having to defer in 83 and 84. Reduced our stocking rate. Still an intensive grazing system. Worked well until we got another dry period. I took the pastures too short. I removed too much standing crop. And we had to destock again. And we had a difficult time recovering from that. Came back, reduced stocking rate further to an animal unit per year for every 25 acres. So tell you in just a second how I came up with that number. And then we did away with our intensive grazing system and went back to a deferred rotational grazing system. And I, to me, I think that's key. And of course, 2011, it was dry, uh, but we had a lot of standing forage. We maintained high infiltration rates. We kept soil temperatures cool. And we recovered quickly when we got rainfall in August. So I said, I'm. Uh, uh, I went with an animal unit for every 25 acres. How did I come up with that stocking rate? Well, Thad Box was asked one time, what is the proper stocking rate? And his answer was, how many cows can you maintain in a drought? Based on the growing conditions on the ASU ranch and the resources we have available to us, if it doesn't rain, I believe I can maintain a cow for every 25 acres. That's what I'm stocked at. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, you're understocked. I can't make a profit. The producers I work with can't make a profit being stocked that life. Maybe not, but I bet you can. you got to look at cost. The ranching industry, we have two types of costs. We have fixed costs and variable costs. Fixed costs don't change. They're the same year in, year out. That's the cost of land, cost of taxes. Whether we're stocked or not stocked, that's the cost of the same year in, year out. What changes as we increase stocking rates so we start increasing stocking rates is variable cost. And variable costs are things like labor, uh, veterinary expenses, supplemental feed is a big one. And you can actually be in a situation where you have higher gross profit but less net profit. That's because variable costs are eating up all your, your profit margin. We'll talk about here in a second a rancher in this area called Frank Price. Some of you may have heard of Frank. He won the NCBA uh, stewardship award a few years ago. And probably more than anyone else, he understands that balance between fixed costs and variable costs, and more importantly, between gross profit and, and net profit. He's not ever concerned about how many calves he sells. He will sell less than his neighbors. They may not look as much well or may not weigh as well as his neighbors, but in the end, because he, he, re, he controls his variable costs, his net profit is much higher. It's one of the few reasons... He's one of the few ranchers I know of that's expanding his ranching operation. So, examples, going back to our ASU example, just to rehash. The ASU ranch is 6,000 acres. We subleased or we leased 1,564 acres at Texas Agri-Life Research and Extension Center. And then of the remaining acreage we have, we have 600 acres of farmland. That leaves us with 3,836 acres of rangeland. I, I mentioned to you, I've got it stocked with animal unit for every 25 acres of rangeland. Again, assuming that it doesn't rain and I can't grow anything on that cropland or farmland, how many cows can I maintain on pasture to a dry condition? Right now, that consists of 74 cows, 10 heifers, 3 bulls, 225 head of sheep, and 45 goats. 
And then we try to defer every pasture every year. A deferment is 90 days of non-use during the growing season. Going back to what I mentioned about plant morphology, that's when these bunch grasses are elevating those terminal meristems, apical meristems, and trying to grow and reproduce. That's when they're susceptible to grazing. Based on our rainfall pattern, we target a 90 day to 120 day window, April, May, June, July, May, June, July, August. We try to have every head of livestock off of our rain clear. By doing that, regardless of how much it rains, we can maximize plant production for that amount of rainfall. We can then utilize that forage for the remainder of the year during the dormant season when it's less susceptible to grazing. How do we do that? We do that because uh, I take about half that crop plant and plant it in hay grazer feed in grass this summer. Uh, my goal every year is to have every cow sheep goat we have on the ranch on hay grazer for at least 90 to 120 days. It doesn't always work out that way, but that's the goal. That allows our pastures, every pasture to go through a period of deferment, allows them to accumulate forage, we maintain grass cover, we maintain high infiltration rates, and we're able to survive those dry conditions. Now, a different example for you is, is Frank Price, I mentioned earlier. And Frank um, has several ranches that are spatially separated. And he's got one employee taking care of each ranch. This is one of those ranches, one he calls King Collins, and it's 13, a little over 13,000 acres, split up in 17 pastures. That's a lot uh, for any one person by himself to take care of. So as a labor-saving tool, Frank came up with his own grazing system. It's based on high intensity, low frequency. And he, wrote, he places all of his cows in one herd, and they're rotated through all 17 pastures. Now, he stocked at a very light rate, an animal unit for every 43 acres. That's a lot stocking rate for this part of the world. They're in each pasture. They're moved based on the calendar, uh, but he's flexible. He makes his decisions on when to rotate those cows to the next pasture based on current conditions in that pasture they're grazing. And he will move those cows when forage has been removed to the point at which that there's still enough remaining forage that if he has to come back to that pasture before it rains, there's still enough forage to support him for another growing cycle. He's got long rest periods, gives his plants a chance to recover, and provides deferment for the majority of those pastures each and every year. It's a great system that works great for him. Interestingly, well, every year I, I usually take a, a group of students out to one of his places and and he used to uh, talk a lot about animal impact and the fact that animal impact is causing the improvements, and they are large, he's dramatically improving those rangelands, was causing the improvements he was seeing. In the last two or three years, his point has always been that the rest that he's providing, those long rest periods, non-grazing periods, at that light stocking rate, is why he's seeing improvements. So that's what he does. If you attended Texas section meeting last year, you had a chance to visit uh, Hugh Stone. He's one of Frank's neighbors. Uh, Hugh's got a ranch called Scrub Oaks. And like most of us, he was a typical cow-calf guy, uh, sheep producer, and it was always, he told me one time, he said it just seemed like he was going from one drought to the next. He was a struggle all the time, and supplemental costs were eating up his feed, his profit margin, supplemental feed costs. And so he got out of the cow-calf business, sheep business, and went to the stalker operation. He buys uh, stalkers, some class of cattle at very or sheep or goats that vary from one year to the next. He buys those animals in October, and then he markets those animals in April. Uh, he does it for two reasons. First and foremost, he's grazing it during the dormant season, after the growing season. There's no livestock left on the ranch during those summer months when it's grasses are trying to grow and reproduce. And so regardless of how much it rains, he can maximize grass growth each and every year. He also does it because uh, historically the cheapest markets within a year are usually in October based on supply and demand principles. And they're usually highest in April. 
Now, having said that, this operation is a high risk, high return. No question about it. Uh, this year is a great example. If you look at the October prices, they were about 25% higher than they are right now. I tell kids it's like investing in bonds or investing in the stock market. You stand a better chance to make more money if you invest your retirement in the stock market, uh, but it's a higher risk. Uh, and so you need to have deep pockets to go with this type of system. You may face years just like this year that you may either lose money or certainly have a hard time making money based on changes, fluctuations in the market. One of the things you can do is, is do like probably most of us do with our retirement program and diversify. I like to use the analogy if you have a 100 cal operation, uh, that's your stocking rate that you think you can maintain through a dry period, stock it with 60 cal. And then uh, you use a deferred rotational grazing system, fewer cows, makes rotation easier, it makes it easier to set aside pastures or deferred pastures in the growing season. Then as you go into the dormant season, in the fall of the year, make up that other 40% with stockers. Uh, Cow-calf operation is fairly safe. They're, they're a lot like investing in bonds, and then you can invest a little bit in some higher risk stuff. Uh, make up some stockers to capture some of that forage you've grown and convert it into something you can make a profit from. I will tell you that there's still some risk that, that's out there with that. Uh, if you don't want to invest in stockers, there's always somebody in your area that's out of grass. Never fails. We can have one of the wettest years on records and drive through Texas in, in late summer and see places that have no standing forage left. Somebody's always out of grass. My only caution to you is that if you if you do bring in somebody else's livestock, pay close attention to the vaccination protocols, those kinds of things. Lots of health issues out there and cause some significant problems. And make sure, at the very least, they're vaccinating for the same bacterial and viral diseases that you may be vaccinating for. All right. So, where does that leave us? Let's try to pull all this stuff together. How do you manage for droughts? You manage for droughts by accumulating forage. You accumulate forage by providing periods of deferment, not grazing. At least a portion of your ranch during the growing season, you do it through conservative stocking rates. Uh, when we see grass species start accumulating above ground forage, we can protect that soil surface, we can maintain high infiltration rates, and we can capture that moisture, and we can avoid a lot of those pitfalls we're going to see from droughts. And, and we're one day closer to the next drought, so they're coming again. We don't know when, but they will be here. One of the things I haven't talked about that's important for uh, managing for droughts is, is continue to do some range improvements. On the ASU Ranch, we, we, we do that each year. We do a lot of brush control each year, prickly pear mesquite work. Uh, we allocate part of our income, particularly from our hunting operation, toward that. Some years we allocate all that income from that. We have a low fence operation. We manage our deer herd much like we manage our cattle operation in that we pay close attention to stocking rates. We have a target that we think we can maintain and they will remain productive. We target a deer density of that number. We then use that income. That's what we use to go through brush control. We've done some aerial spraying this year, a little bit of prescribed burning. We'll do some IPT work as well to help maintain uh, adequate bunch grass cover so that we provide feed for our livestock, nesting sites for our quail, and able to capture that moisture. The end result has been is not only is our livestock operation um, profited from that approach, so is our white tailed deer operation. Again, we're not high fence, I think I mentioned that, and we don't feed on a year round basis. That's a range raised deer that we, we harvested this past year. Gross food and crock score is 172. Field rest 155 pounds. Uh, net Boone and Crockett scored 168. So he's incredibly deer, incredibly good deer. Very proud that we're able to do that while producing uh, feed for our livestock at the same time. And those two enterprises are certainly complementary if they're managed correctly. Well, let me leave you with this. Um, Successful businessmen, creative scientists, successful ranchers all share the same characteristics. They seek opportunities, they take chances, they remain a skeptic of everyone else's paradigms and their own, and their own paradigms. 
and they rely on science even though it may not be perfect to make their decisions. And then most importantly, learn from your failures. Learn from your failures and hopefully you've learned from some of mine. So with that, that's all I've got. Uh, I think Pete may have some other things he'd want to say. I'd be glad to, to entertain any questions. I've been watching over my chat screen. I haven't seen any questions pop up yet, but I'd be glad to try to answer those for you if I can.